Hi, I'm Mark Madison, the historian at the National Conservation Training Center, and we just had Lincoln Brower out, uh, a person who's probably worked longer and done more to protect monarch butterflies than any scientist uh, in the 20th and 21st century. And because he's had such a long and, and uh, impactful career, we thought it'd be uh, great uh, to learn a little more about your career trajectory and uh, how you got to this place where you're probably our preeminent monarch butterfly conservationist. Mm -hmm. uh, and to help us along with this history, we have uh, his wife, Linda Fink, professor of biology at Sweetbriar College, who has actually uh, dug up a slideshow uh, covering the, the history of, of Lincoln's life. So thank you both for helping us uh, inspire future uh, young conservationists to, to pursue this rewarding field and maybe see um, what career paths have been like for other uh, prominent conservationists. So thank you both. All right. And thank you, Mark, for inviting us here to your beautiful facility. Oh, we're happy to host you. <laughs> All right. Well, let's see what we can learn about Lincoln the scientist. There, not very well done. Okay, <laughs> so I'd like to introduce you to Lincoln, the person. You've seen the science that he's been doing. Lincoln st started out in New Jersey, and as a little boy, he was an animal lover. I think there are many photographs of him with different dogs and cats over the time. But in addition to loving dogs and cats, he loved doing science, and here are signs from his room from different points in his childhood. And he was interested in all animals, but he was especially interested in butterflies, and his aunt tied him up with a local German amateur entomologist, Charles Rummel. And Charles Rummel mentored Lincoln when, he was about, when Lincoln was about 10 years old. We see on the left, Rummel has a whole host plant covered with netting in which he was growing some caterpillars, and on the right, he has a bait trap. And Lincoln, by hanging out with Rummel, learned an awful lot of the techniques of studying Lepidoptera. And we still have some of Rummel's traps and cages in our basement. And, and we his still use them. And his mounting boards. <laughs> so they're still in use many, many decades later. This is Lincoln. Um, showing his interest in butterflies on the left, we see Lincoln with a bait trap behind him and then with a butterfly net on the right. So as a young boy and as a young man, this is what he did in his time off. He got in trouble once in school for cutting class to go collect, what were you collecting? For sale, what was it? Um, it was a beautiful little green moth. Okay, and, and, what, kind of and what kind of trouble did you get into in school? I got suspended for a day and humiliated. I had to sit in one classroom in one chair all day long. <laughs> Was it worth it? Absolutely. Right. <laughs> Look where you are now, and your teacher's forgotten. All right, so Lincoln, despite this terrible uh, malfeasance in, in, in school, went to Princeton as an undergraduate where he studied biology. Um, and then he did his graduate work at Yale and did his dissertation on swallowtail butterfly speciation with his field work up in Colorado with his wife, Jane Van Zant Brower. Lincoln started his academic career at Amherst College, moved from there to University of Florida where he enjoyed working with graduate students um, for almost two decades. And then when he retired, he moved to Sweetbriar College as a research professor of biology, joining me um, when I became appointed to the biology department there. So Lincoln, in his research in the 1960s and 70s, became very interested in adaptive coloration and mimicry. And so here we see a cover photo from Natural History. Lincoln and Jane did experiments. Here they were feeding, offering a toad, all sorts of bumblebees and bumblebee mimics. Um, and so they did a series of experiments that tried to help explain how mimicry works in nature. They also did a lot of work in Trinidad, um, and here they're doing more experimental work with predators of different kinds of insects. So they have cages here, and in this next slide, they were putting out different kinds of prey and offering them to bird predators to really try to understand how predation works um, when you have prey that are warningly colored. So Lincoln, what were the birds you were using as predators here? They were tanagers, called the silver big tanager, which were the very abundant insectivorous bird in Trinidad. 
easy to catch and easy to handle. All right. And Lincoln would, would bring students down, students from Amherst College and Mount Holyoke College as well. Um, not all of Lincoln's work was on adaptive coloration. He and students also d worked on the courtship behavior of the queen butterfly, which is the monarch's closest relative um, in North America, and a, a paper that's now considered a classic in animal behavior um, on the queen, courtship of the queen, and they also made a film of the courtship of the queen butterfly. Now, one aspect of Lincoln's research over time is that he figures out what methods are going to work for a particular question. So sometimes scientists are, will come up with a particular method that they use and apply that method to many different organisms. Lincoln pretty much has been focusing on insects and their predators and throughout his career has used a wide variety of techniques to ask about them. So here we see an example of Lincoln deciding he needs a big cage so that he can <laughs> study monarchs flying or study the courtship behavior and figured out how to get somebody to construct this cage for them. Um, as I've said, they did a lot of work on adaptive coloration in Trinidad. And here also, uh, this is a, a warningly co colored sphingid caterpillar. Um, some other uh, warningly colored insects featured in a film Lincoln made about um, adaptive coloration. That film, Patterns for Survival, is still a great film. It looks a bit dated. It sounds a bit dated, but there's some really good natural history in it. And here's Lincoln with uh, a student and a field assistant in Trinidad and swiping at something. <laughs> And so another example of Lincoln's experimental methods, uh, they wanted to study the effectiveness of mimicry in the wild. And what they decided to do, the technique they figured out, was to take one of the silk moths, one of the um, Saturniid moths. The females send out a pheromone to attract the males. So Lincoln and his colleagues figured out that if they painted males, if they painted the wings to look like different kinds of insects, and then lured them back into trap, released them in the wild, lured them back into traps um, because fem virgin females were in those traps sending out the pheromone, that they could look at the recapture rates and figure out if uh, moths painted with certain markings would be recaptured at higher rates than moths with different markings. Now the experiment involved hoisting these big traps with virgin female moths high up into the trees. Here we see that the uh, Lincoln's colleagues hoisting them up and then they would look at what kinds of recaptures they got. And while this was a really great method and had a whole lot of methods, one thing we should say now in 2015 is we wouldn't do an experiment like this today uh, of taking <laughs> North American moths to Trinidad and releasing them, but it was okay by the laws of, of the time. I just want to say that, but how effective was this experiment? Well, it worked. But we didn't show a strong difference between the two types that we expected. But subsequently, it was repeated by Sternberry and Waldbauer. In North in America. North America, and it worked. Right, right. It's so you did the proof of concept of this very complicated method yes. and just didn't have enough of a sample size right. within the time season right. you had. It was maddening because we did it over three summers. We released hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of moths. Right. And didn't release any females. No, not a one. <laughs> All right. So in Lincoln's talk, he spent a lot of time talking about the ecological chemistry, the study of the relationships of the toxins in the plants that are taken up by the monarch caterpillars, stored in the monarchs throughout their life, and giving the adults chemical, some degree of chemical protection. And this is just an example of another technique. Lincoln had to collaborate with chemists to develop the techniques to learn how much cardinalide was in individual butterflies. So this was an early spectrophotometry um, analysis that Lincoln was doing. Now, since we're talking to a Fish and Wildlife Service audience, I just wanted to point out that Lincoln also has a strong interest in river ecology and conservation, did some conservation work in the Connecticut River Valley of Massachusetts, and made two films. So in 1972 is an ecological film, Flooding River, a study of river iron ecology, which is about the Connecticut River. Uh, you can see the beautiful flood here. I don't know what year this was, 1960, early 1970s? 
early 60s, I think. Early 60s. Mid 60s. Mid 1960s. But Lincoln also became very interested in dams and challenges of uh, humans controlling rivers. And Lincoln uh, did a film that focused both on the Rapid City flood in 1972 and a Mississippi River flood in the same year. And so here we see some of the shots from Lincoln making a second film called Planning for Floods. Here's Lincoln uh, filming uh, somewhere in the Midwest. So then I just have a few shots of Lincoln in Mexico uh, through the years. As Lincoln said, he, and, and that's where I first met him, I did my undergraduate research with Lincoln at Amherst College and went down to Mexico for my undergraduate thesis. And then I've continued working with him periodically um, since then. So Lincoln first went to Mexico in January 1977. Right. So you just have a series of shots of Lincoln um, throughout the decades. This was camping in that big 1981 storm. This is Lincoln's favorite place in Mexico, or one of them. His colleagues call this Brower Point. <laughs> and he did a lot of his work with his colleague, Bill Calvert. So Lincoln mentioned in his talk with you um, the good work that the Mexican government mm -hmm. has done in protecting the monarchs, uh, protecting the monarch habitat from illegal logging. These are two um, policemen who were there to the protect the butterflies. Yeah. They certainly seemed intimidating to us. Okay. And again, Lincoln has been a photographer and filmmaker throughout his career, so his talk was illustrated with almost exclusively his own photographs, and I hope some people who watch this will find ways of ferreting out his films and watching those as well. Here are the different films that Lincoln made over time. And uh, Lincoln started his talk by acknowledging the many people and agencies who had helped him with his research through time, and I just want to point out also that for a scientist to be able to have a many decades of research, um, it takes an awful lot of funding from a lot of good sources to make that possible. So I hope that helps people get a little better sense of who Lincoln is. It certainly does. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Lincoln. Thank this was you. incredibly informative. Nice and uh, you right. synthesized 50 plus years into about 15 minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome.